We were trying to teach kids to be resilient, but what we weren't doing is trying to help them sit in discomfort and understand that it's okay to be uncomfortable and not to have an escape plan all the time. Welcome to The Optimalist, a podcast where we have set out to examine the higher order capabilities that we need to build an optimal future with AI. I'm Sarah, your host through this exploration of the elements of human flourishing. So let's figure out together how we cultivate them. This week's guest is the co-creator of Thriving School Community, a revolutionary program designed for schools to improve mental health. She holds an MS in both education and social work as a 20-year veteran in the field. As a global keynote speaker, she delivers powerful messages of hope to educators and facilitates meaningful professional development. She successfully equips school staff with practical tools to mitigate teacher burnout and the youth mental health crisis, providing relief to schools all across the country. Her unique lens as a high school teacher turned clinical therapist specializing in trauma makes her stories relevant and captivating to educators struggling in today's system. So today, I invite you to listen to some of those stories in my conversation with Charlie Peck. In order to thrive, we really do have to learn to adapt, but we don't know how to do that. Or or the adult and the kids' lives aren't adapting very well or modeling that. So we're stuck. We're stuck a lot. I'm actually just preparing some, and I'm doing a ton of things actually, but one that I'm loving, it's called Anxiety and Avoidance, Signs and Solutions, and I'm delivering it to schools and everything. So it's really neat. Like that is about adaptability. That anxiety piece is so big right now. And it's, there's so much we can do. Yeah. And regarding avoidance, like, are you talking about with students specifically? A school avoidance for students, but avoidance socially and yeah. adults. Like there's so many teachers stepping out of education and avoiding the tough stuff. And there's some generational gaps there too, but really things are just very heavy for everybody. That's interesting that you said that, like stepping out of teaching, that makes it sound like it's a little bit more than just thinking of it in terms of burning out or or even just wanting a different direction. For some people just leave because they want to try something else. That's what I did. I was in the classroom for 14 years and I was just like, there's five other things I want to do and let's see. And eventually I made it back to a place where I'm doing some of all of those things and I'm working with teachers again. So um, right. So That's all of exciting. them, they wind up converging at some point. But, but yeah, but it sounds like you're finding another piece of that, that it's not just all about burnout, that it also is not being able to adapt maybe. Mm-hmm. A- absolutely. It's a big part of it. I mean, there's so many pieces to it, but I focus on improving school mental health as a system, mm-hmm. but then within the system are, are all the people. And, and that is who we have to equip. It's a little bit bigger than that, but yeah. I mean, I spent, I've been in education for over 20 years and I spent, started K and I made my way up all the way through high school, like so elementary to high school. But I decided to uh, teach high school for 18 years and there are so many problems with students and their mental health. And then I heard my colleagues like, why is this happening? We're surrounded by all these sports. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I decided to become a clinical therapist and um, got a master of social work degree to understand the structural issues. So that's where I'm coming from. Now I work with schools across the country to equip their entire school community. So that's what it's called thriving school community. That's the program. Mm. So everybody within the system can do better because kids will do better when they're better at home and at school. And it starts with us. It does. And that's actually what I talk to people a lot about is um, what we wind up thinking that we need to require of students before we're actually requiring it of ourselves. And that includes in our home lives. And like, if you're, you know, an adult living with children of any age, like, what does that, what does that look like? Are they seeing you consistently distracted? Are they seeing you pulled into media while you're telling them not to be pulled into media? They, they're simple things that apply to a lot of modeling in any type of behavior or environment. But I think when it comes to technology and the mental health issues that we're seeing today, like we often forget that kids are watching us be pulled into the same like disastrous circumstances, I think, and we don't have a hold on it. I, you know, I'm, I'm just so interested in people who are working with entire systems that like, how do you get adults to sign into that and work on it themselves and know that there's something that they have to work on that's a piece in their own lives before they can mm-hmm. really make an impact school wide. 
I don't know if that's a part of what you do, but it seems mm-hmm. to be something that, yeah, like that it would have to be. It has to be. It does yeah. because that's the only power we have. We don't have the power to change the system the way we want. And it's frustrating to work within it. Yeah. We have all these constraints and we feel powerless. And that's part of the problem is feeling powerless, but we're not. But if we tell ourselves that story that we are, then we sink down into that and then we feel despair. And that is a really tough place to function if mm-hmm. we're functioning from despair. And eventually we lose trust and hope. And and that's that's tough to get out of. So we are the ones who hold that power. But do you know what we've been doing, Sarah, for 30 years to try to improve mental health for our youth? We've been trying to teach them SEL skills and resiliency skills. Right. Right. And you know mm-hmm. that you've been a part of that yep. system, but then we don't equip adults in the system with those skills right. or skills that are easier to actually obtain. And so we throw those kids right back into those same stressful environments with mm-hmm. burned out teachers, stressed out parents. And then we're expecting them to function well. So that's been a major part of the system too. That's been a, a just a big flaw. So if you can think of the the major things that you're work that you know the major things that you're working on in your career now, and um, maybe look back at the path that's brought you there. What would you say were were some some they could be people? Usually people talk about. Sometimes people talk about other people, but usually it's events or things that changed for you that inspired the path that that what you're doing at this moment, like why this is so important to you. Mm -hmm. It started off a long time ago in the early teaching years. And one of the stories that I always tell is about, uh, I call her Madison. I always have to catch myself because that's not her real name. (laughs) But Madison was one of my students who would get up. She got up out out of class one day and just left. Didn't ask my permission didn't tell me, just left for most of the class, came back at the very end and then just kind of blew me off when the bell rang when I was trying to approach her. And so it was a a tough moment. And I actually got called to the principal's office Mm -hmm. later that afternoon. And the principal told me, well, just let her do that. I'm like, what? I mean, I felt very dismissed, Sarah. I just, Mm -hmm. I thought that was so wrong without any explanation, by the way. So the rest of the semester went on and I just let her do that. But I was really frustrated and I had a lot of animosity. And so fast forward, the end of the semester comes up. I, we didn't get along well. She gave me a ton of attitude. And when the second semester was starting, I didn't want to feel that way anymore. I didn't like that relationship. It, it just stuck with me. It didn't feel good. That's not what I did with students. And so I went to the school counselor and I said, can you give me Madison's schedule? And I'm going to go find her and just make amends. I'm going to say, I'm sorry. And she said, well, Madison passed away. Oh my God. So Madison was sitting in our classroom with a Mm. terminal illness and nobody told me. And here I am, this new teacher. And so what that brings me to teach everybody in the system is like, because I opened my eyes up to people different, my students differently. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, I wonder what's going on with that kid. I wonder what's going on with that kid Mm -hmm. and this kid. And I found out that I may never know what's going on, but there's always something going on. And so that's what I try to tell teachers, anybody who works with kids, parents, anybody who works with kids, that there is something else going on. And we may never know that whole story. So we've got to create a secure space for every single kid. And then that also works with leaders too, who work with staff. So that's a pivotal, that's definitely a pivotal moment that would have, uh, I can see how that, that ties into almost everything that, that you would talk about. (laughs) Yeah. And that's just one, it's just one of many, I mean, one of many pivotal early yeah. teaching experiences. Plus I have life experiences that just, mm-hmm. it all seemed to come together. And I thought I've, we've got to do something different. What we're doing is just not working. And so many people are struggling. And how, what do you see as the response from adults in school communities when you start to do this work with them? Do you, are you in the, and I don't know how I'm, I'm not exactly sure how, how that all unfolds too. Are you working with people hands-on? Or are you setting up them to facilitate on their own? Well, <laughs> yes. Yes. yes Everything. Yes. So the idea is uh, I, I do work with school districts and mm-hmm. some individual schools and I go there on their PD days and I run okay. sessions, but there's only one of me. Mm-hmm. And so I, I can't reach everybody. And there's, there's such a huge response, Sarah, because they are really craving this. So 93% of our, our teachers are reporting that they do want to improve their skills with, with kids. They want to meet their needs better, but then they feel inequipped ill-equipped, I should right. say. And so that's part of what I do is I equip them. So they they always want more. They either want more time or we have nine skills 
they want to work with the skills in different ways. So I work with them and teach them. And then I also just rolled out a course. So one of the courses is the smaller pieces responding to challenging student behaviors, because that is what's just making teachers feel. I just feel wrote so that good. down. I Did wanted to really? ask you about that a little bit. Yeah. Yes. It's something I it's think a about a lot. Piece. It's a huge piece. Mm -hmm. And the other, there's another module called managing, preventing and managing our overwhelm because that's the other piece. It's just, there's so much to do, but there is a, there is a whole certification course called certified school mental health facilitator where they can actually roll out these found like foundationally, they can, they can roll them out in their schools themselves and their districts. And that way they create sustainability because I can't be there. And so it's not the train the trainer, it's actually a level down. So it's not as overwhelming, Mm. but an answer to your question. Yes. So I do the work. I do speak. I do keynotes as well, Mm -hmm. but then I actually equip them and and that's, that's new. Yeah. And so then, yeah, back to the, the question that I was tacking onto that was just how, what is the response from adults in the building when you're, when you're setting, like, is it excitement, relief, or is there resistance to doing this kind of work? Like, do you, I don't know what, what do you get from people? Yeah, all of that. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> right? it depends it's almost on- like I've talked to people about this before. <laughs> and I know <laughs> Imagine you're that. There. <laughs> Imagine that. I will say the majority, Sarah, is people craving this. They are craving this. And I knew that. I mean, this has been my head for 10 years. I finally get to roll it out. That's why I got my social work degree like five years ago, right? I was still teaching. I knew what I was eventually going to need to do, but I wanted to still be in teaching to still understand it. And then Working as a clinical therapist specializing in trauma, um, I worked with families and kids, adolescents who were in a hospital setting or a residential setting so that I could understand systemically what was going on, not only with in the school system, but with parents and families and what was contributing going back and forth. So the reason I tell you that they're all craving this, we're all craving this. All adults who work with kids in some capacity are craving this because it does provide them with relief. So that's what you're asking is what, how are they responding? They're, they need it, um, as a relief for themselves. So they're not feeling overwhelmed. And also here's the biggest thing, you know, this from teaching, Mm -hmm. what happens when you tell a kid that you want them to do something and you're just thinking in your mind, like, oh my gosh, I hope they do because I don't know what I'll do if they told, right? (laughs) We give those scenarios. We talk about, well, what, what's in your control? Like we give very simple tools. We moved away from giving tons of strategies because they're so overwhelmed. Everybody is so overworked, overwhelmed with so much to do. Mm -hmm. And so they are craving these skills that we give them because they are simplified. It's like taking a 25 page essay and synthesizing it to just one paragraph or even one sentence sometimes. And so when they look at the skill, we're like, yes, it is simple because Mm -hmm. it has to be easy to remember us. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I did when I was working, I even did this when I was working in the hospital where there was a kid who he came in and the, the, Cops dropped him off and they said, listen, if he doesn't comply with you, we're going to pick him back up and take him to juvie. And so this is like a 15 year old guy. We're like, we know mental health wise, like this isn't good for his treatment plan to always have the threat of going back to juvie, going to jail, not right. going to work. So we were helping him really, I mean, really focused on him. So I said, listen, Mason, when you get stressed out, I want you to come to me and we're going to work through what's called the path of possibilities. So he came to me one day. Well, he came to me a lot, but he came to me one time and he's like, I want to punch this other kid in the face because this other kid was really bothering him and his stress response system is already highlighted. All right. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, okay, what don't you want? He's like, well, I don't want to go to juvie. I said, okay, what do you want? Freedom. He wanted freedom. And so I said, if you punch that kid in the face, where will that get you? he's like, well, it's not going to get me a freedom. It's going to put me in juvie. I said, right. right. What can you do? And he said, well, I could go back to my room. I could go do my breathing and stress ball. And I said, great. I'll meet you in group in five minutes. Mm-hmm. And he came in five minutes. And he had learned to do that. It's so, so very simple. But we have visuals and everything. So teachers want to have more of these tools that they can easily pull up in the midst of that chaos and overwhelm to not only help their kids, their students, but to help them. Yeah. And you're talking about what most I think would probably interpret as a little bit more of an extreme example, but you can take exactly what you did, the five minutes, the pause, like we, we build into our tools, what we call recharging activities. And so those activities are like such a wide range of things that could help you do exactly what you are helping that student do 
which was literally just to take a break and switch his mental, I think, mindset, right? Into a different mode. Um, Hmm. There are other things that you might need to break for, like maybe you've had an overload of using technology too much that day. And so you need to go and regain a sense of like, you know, being disconnected, uh, you know, whatever it might be. So taking those pauses is something I think that I also see people craving, like when they, like they all know part like that they should be doing it. But I think it's so hard to create a routine and the routines are what are going to help us become adaptable. We hear things where people do like mindful Mondays and they're only doing it one time a week. Or they do it once in the morning every day, but it it winds up being a pattern for that moment, but not something that you can use as a tool when you when you realize that you need it. It's absolutely right. I mean, yeah, this is all based on brain science, neuroscience, mm-hmm. all of that, um, the neuroplasticity, all of that adaptability pieces is, is so important. I don't think people realize how much we do have the ability to rewire our brain response. And so when you say, mm-hmm. well, people just, people need to recharge. They absolutely do. One of the mm-hmm. parts that's missing, Sarah, is knowing when that needs to happen yeah. and paying closer attention to that. And so just getting ourselves used to knowing, like noticing when our body, our nervous system is responding to that stress that started in our brain. Mm-hmm how to even recognize that so that we know to shift, like know to neutralize. The tool I use there is after we get to a point where we have to neutralize that brain response and get back to baseline so we can access that prefrontal cortex to make decisions in ways that we're not going to regret. And so the recharge is great. And you're right. Routine is very difficult. Um, Mm -hmm. Structure is sometimes difficult because when we're in the midst of chaos, I mean, we might structure our time as teachers, for example, to be at our desk and have some quiet time. But what happens when you look up when you were expecting to have 10 minutes to yourself to get ready for your next class and you have a line of students there for you? And you feel like you can't push them away. You can't turn them away. (laughs) We feel like that. And we have a lot of shoulds that we throw at ourselves Mm -hmm. during those moments too. Yeah. But I am thinking about the student behavior issue that you we were starting to touch on a little bit, but I was writing it down because I did want to think about uh, or get your take on what you have observed over the last few years as what people have described as this crisis in student behavior. In that time period, I've been out of the classroom now for five years exactly. So that's kind of the time period that this has escalated. So I haven't experienced it firsthand myself. And I'm so interested in how, uh, from the perspective of what you do and pushing into schools and working on these specific skills with them, how you're seeing that play what, and, and what your take is on, on what is causing it. We can, ju- we can say, oh, it's a mental health issue, but what are, like, what is it? Like, what is, what is causing that issue? And is it really just pandemic related or is it, coming from before that. That was a lot of questions stacked up for you. <laughs> it's okay. I'll do my best. I got you. You can do you. it. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> I think about this all the time anyway. Well, I was there when we when we went into um, virtual learning and all of that. I was there for all of that, still in the classroom. So I get it. It's a struggle. Um, mm-hmm. These problems were happening well before COVID. Well before COVID. In fact, that's why I, it all led up to me doing this work. And then COVID hit. And so what happened is we have a generation where we try to soften our approach with parenting. Okay. Number one, by the way, I'm a parent of three kids myself, mm-hmm. 10, almost 13 and a 20 year old. So like I, I've been there, <laughs> still there. Oh my God. Got all the age ranges covered. <laughs> yeah, I really do. I got a lot, I got a lot going on in there. Um, and it's the most painful guilt ridden job you can ever have in your entire life. And so what I, what I realized is that we try to shift our approach. And then there's a generation of where we're trying to talk more about mental health. We're trying to soften our approach and support our kids better. But what I noticed is a lot of people didn't really know how to do that well. And so, again, we were trying to teach kids to be resilient. But what we weren't doing is trying to help them sit in discomfort Mm -hmm. and understand that it's okay to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And not to have an escape plan all the time. Like it's, it's okay to learn to sit in that discomfort. And then, by the way, I was also there through the teaching and parenting of social media and the phones and yeah, all of that too. just has shifted everything. Mm-hmm. So it's not one thing. It's a, it's an accumulation of all of these changes socially that we're trying to adapt to as parents and as educators and as kids. And there's not one right answer. So here's like, go, let's go back to the mental health piece. One of the major issues I've seen and that I experienced is that if we don't create that 
secure space for kids to want to show up to your classroom. They're not going to either show up or they're not going to show up in a way that they're going to engage in the best way possible. And a lot of things that go on with them, they're bringing into the classroom with, like I said before, things that we don't even know they're coming into that classroom with. Mm -hmm. All right. By the way, there's sometimes like 30 of those kids (laughs) sitting in front of you. Mm -hmm. Right. The other thing is, is that we're coming into the classroom with those things too. And so there's a lot going on in our nervous system. And if we're not paying attention to it, we might have feel like we're being personally attacked. We might feel like where there's some kind of threat that might happen. So we're anticipating that we are, we're ignoring our feelings of discomfort and letting them get to a point that it becomes like irritability. And then it might jump right to enrage very quickly. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of people just out of sorts because there's not a, there, when we don't know what to do, we're going to do nothing and we're going to keep doing the same things that weren't working. Right. So with all of these social shifts, all of these things changing, the traditional education wasn't the, isn't the answer mm-hmm. and traditional parenting hasn't been the answer. So we're all kind of, they, we're all in le- kind of limbo there. So when we have that, then we have a lot of anxiety when we're anticipating something that we're not sure about. We get stressed when we're over flooded, which we're flooded all the time with these stress hormones now, as opposed to in the past. Mm -hmm. And if we're constantly flooded, we're constantly reacting rather than responding. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, there's a lot. And then another little piece to that, Sarah, I mean, there's so much more to this, but another piece to that, Sarah, is if we talk more about anxiety, some people get frustrated about that because they're like, well, now you're going to have a bunch of people saying that I have anxiety. Which I feel like that was already happening. Even when I was, was still teaching, I had so many kids and I, being oh. someone that has suffered from anxiety, it, like d- in different capacities, my, and then have overcome a lot of it. I often did wonder, I'm like, I'm not sure how many of them know what they're saying to me when they say that. Cause I think they just apply. And that wasn't the only word, but they, they are around people who say these words and then they apply them to what it is that they think they might feel in the moment. Not that they have that ongoing, but in the moment I have anxiety. Correct. Which is very normal to have. And in fact, it's important to pay attention to. We need to actually have those stressors in our lives. We learn to adapt to them. Not that we want to add them on purpose, but we need to just pay attention and know that we're going to be okay and safe. And that's what helps our nervous system not go into shock every time or with trauma is a whole nother thing, but they're all kind of related. There's a lot to it. And if we just had a little more education around it and tools to manage it, that's that's where we're making these improvements. So a couple things from from what you were just saying. So how do we create these spaces? I don't know if it's in the space or in the attitude of the adults that are around us, but where we are allowing everybody or encouraging people to sit with discomfort or be able to tackle harder things that they might not want to. Like we started this conversation talking about avoidance. I mean, I, we just kind of mentioned it. We didn't really go into it in depth yet, but you know, we know that that's what kids are doing. <laughs> and so I don't know, like, is it, is it, do you tackle this in the way you create the space or the school community? Cause I'm, I'm hearing also the words, like we talk a lot about traditional education, the traditional school setup, and a lot of kids are bored in that system, but how do you take some of the things that maybe there could be some things that we could keep from that system that actually keep us. I don't know. I, I could be wrong. I'm just thinking like what, what encourages sitting with nothing that leads to creativity and leads to curiosity? Um, how do we design that in a school? Yeah. Well, the best thing is, is every single teacher has control of their classroom. Yeah. I mean, they get to decide how it, I mean, you're limited to space and furniture and budget, but you can give kids movement. Every single kid from preschool up to high school, it actually adults to, we need more movement, period. We need more movement. We need to stop having teachers talk and talk and talk. We need to let, not necessarily always have group work or partner work, but have a little bit more purposeful engagement. The problem-based learning is actually huge. I mean, you look at Finland. Finland has an excellent system where they, first of all, they regard teachers so so highly there, number one. Mm-hmm. And teachers are really skilled. They're very skilled. And, and they're, they allow kids to do problem-based learning, but also just tackle from lots of different curriculum angles. So I know that there's a lot of constraints in our system. We have to work within them. I mean, we're not going to change those. So what can you do? Well, if you have a problem, let's 
let's get creative or let's ask the kids to get a little bit more creative. But I, again, it does get back like movement. Let, let me give you some examples. Number one, I had a ninth grade class and there were a lot of boys in it. And it was at the end of the day. And so the last few minutes of the day, depending on what was going on, if I knew that we needed a shift in energy, then first of all, I get to do something about that. So a teacher, if you're noticing kids not, you know, they're just not energetic and you try to push through that, you know, that's just not working. You're, you lost them. Mm-hmm. And so do some movement, put on, I mean, I put on, what was that called? The dance dance revolution or whatever <laughs> I put it on. And I mean, these cute little ninth, ninth grade kids would just get in the back and they would just get in the back of the room and just do some of the dancing. And it yeah. took five minutes and we come back to, it. or a couple of the boys who needed that movement. I'm like, oh my gosh, they would get up and um, they kind of do like jumps or they would, you know, like I always imagine volleyball because I was a volleyball player, like going to pretend to do a hit in the air or whatever. But giving them the space to do that, it it let them know that, listen, I'm not going to try to make you feel so confined because I know that's contributing to your attitude. I know this about because I knew that I was going to get the best of them if, if they could just hold off for a few more minutes here and telling them, okay, let's get three more minutes of this. Then we're going to do this for another 60 to 90 seconds. And then you guys are going to have two, two minutes to talk with your friends. Mm. Like we got to give them the respect enough to give them some predictability so that they can tell themselves to get through this point to then get to that. And then they'll have a little outlet, like so many things. Another little thing that I do and I did this again for all my high schoolers, even up to my senior students, I put a basket in front of them of some manipulatives. But even if you just give them one pipe cleaner, I'm telling you, yeah. there's a lot you can do with a pipe cleaner. They're cheap. Mm-hmm. They're, they've got different textures to them. They can move them around in their hands. There's so many kids who have energy, mental, social, physical energy. They got to get out of their body. It's a nervous system response. Just knowing that to give that to them, to do something in their hands, that's not going to offend you as a teacher. Yeah. It's going to help you give them those pieces. Like there's lots of little things like that. But if we just respect the fact that they need movement, they need a voice, we need to show them how to use that voice to to advocate for themselves, give them the space to do it. You're creating security for them and they'll want to show up for you. I used to keep a little basket and this, this like developed over time. It started with like, I did it with like one one thing. And then I wound up making it into a little basket of these little mini Sesame Street puppets. We didn't use them as puppets, but they looked, they didn't even, they looked like just little stuffed animals of, of, of Sesame Street characters. And it started with, with, I had an Elmo one from a speech class that I was in when I was in high school, I was a senior in high school. And so the teacher had a larger Elmo stuffed out Elmo doll and she would have us hold it when we would do extemporaneous speech presentation so that you didn't have to, but it was just sitting there against the blackboard in the front of the room. And if you want it, so like over months of time being in that course, like you've got, you know, six foot senior guys going up and grabbing Elmo and just holding and, and it just became so normal. So then I wasn't teaching speech, so to speak, but I was I wound up getting one such little thing and then building it into a collection because I just had it available for people who wanted to hold that in. They could be standing up in front of a group or in front of the class, but it it could just be where you walk in and feel like I want to hold this in my hand today. And eventually it became over a few years where that, that I think I had like eight of them that would be gone and kids would be asking me for them. And then I would, they would disappear and I'd get picture. Then the smartphone generation came in and I'd get pictures of kids hiding them in the bathroom. Like where are Miss Candela's doll? Like it became a whole thing. And I had to start labeling them. It was wild. It was, it became like a funny thing, but you could tell like when they had it on their desk, like they wanted it there for a reason. But the reason I did that was not just because, because of the experience I had in my, in that class that I took in high school. Because she was doing it because you were standing up in a vulnerable position, picking a topic out of a hat, basically, and and practicing speaking about a topic off the top of your head. And so, yeah, you're standing up there alone in front of your peers, and it's weird as a 17 year old. So here, just hold this thing, and it keeps your mind like focused on something else. Doesn't matter what you're holding. But it wasn't just that. It was that when I then went to my student teaching. The teacher that I taught with had this habit. I don't know if all the kids knew it in his class. He was also teaching seniors. But as someone sitting anywhere in the room, which was me observing him teach half the time, I would notice that anytime he would leave his desk or the back of the room to go to the front of the room 
where he would be then talking like or be this he would be the center of attention for even a few minutes he would make sure he walked to where he kept his like pen like pens and pencils in like a jar and he would always pick up a pen every time and and hold it and twirl it in his right hand and i thought to myself I'm looking, I don't know if the kids are like, it's not like in a distracting way, but it would just, just always be holding it in some way. Never was he speaking in front of people without that pen. And I thought, and he was such a good speaker. And I was like, if that makes him really this dumb little thing in his hand and it writing implement that makes him captivating. He was known for his lectures. Like kids loved who, where do you hear that kids love hearing a, t- a teacher lecture in high school? No, like he was right. a traditional, like, there was no group activity. There was nothing, no project-based learning. It, this was a lecturer and kids were riveted by him. And he did this little thing. And I thought if if an adult male can do that and, and feel comfortable and no one says anything, then here, why can't my teenagers take something and hold it when they're working and if it or standing in front of other people? And so they would and occasionally they would ask, like, well, why do we like, why do we need to hold this? And I'm like, well, if it if it gives you a sense of security and makes you feel powerful and and gives you a sense that you you don't have to it doesn't matter how old you are, you know, you can do whatever you want. Uh, as long as you're as, as long as you feel like you're in your own body. Just that little thing from like I always remember that from my student teaching. Like that's just such a weird lesson of like noticing like this guy always hold he makes a point to pick up that pen every time he walks to the front of the room. And if he can do it, then we all can. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it, it depends on who you are and what it is. I mean, it's it's factoring. It's it's being able to like touch an object. And if you've studied with it, or, or one of the things I would tell my students, like take a pen or a pencil, first of all, write out your notes because it is much better for your brain and memory. And it does help connect and keep it into your long-term memory when you do that. And also if you light like a candle that's vanilla and you study for the test while you're writing out your notes and smelling that smell and then you smell that smell before you take the test, I mean, all of your senses are picking back up on that. And it might even be a little bit more complex than that, but those little things might make a difference for some kids. You know, it really, it goes back to what captivates kids is one, when you listen to them Mm -hmm. and two, when you can be a little playful, I mean, maybe that was kind of playful for that teacher. Or Could be. Whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say, but one of the things that that is super helpful is to laugh with your kids, laugh with the students. I don't care what age it is. Be playful mm-hmm. and laugh because when you're laughing, you can't be stressed. Your stress response system and your brain shuts right down. And so even those moments, like having a silly word or the stuffed animals, I mean, all of that stuff is great because it when you do notice something's off or needs to shift, then you can do it very quickly. I mean, you can right. so quick. There's like, we do rapid resets. It's kind of like your re-energizers. There's a mm-hmm. lot of things to, the most important piece there is noticing that it needs to happen and then doing something about it. Most of the people listening to this are classroom teachers. We're getting a little bit increasing number of school or building leaders are starting to become a part of our audience. And also the people that I'm interviewing as well are a lot, a lot more principals, which I love. Uh, maybe you want to, if you can leave either group or both groups with an advice, like piece of advice of getting started with, because there's such a, you know, across the country, wide variety of adoption of, of mental health practices or services. Like you could have a school that's so fully equipped that they have a wellness coordinator, coordinator and an SEL coordinator. And then you have schools that don't even have access to any of that. And so it's such a wide, like vast it's so difficult to think about what advice to give, but what, what could you give people trying to start thinking about taking this a little bit more seriously? Well, if I work with leaders, I always say this, make sure you ask your staff what they need to do their job better and try to help them get it. Now it could be, I always do, what's your wish list? Like what are the, if money was no object, what would you want? Not that we're going to necessarily get that for them, but give them a voice to at least ask them. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Right. And if, yeah. if it's an, an expensive item, what is it that I can get you that, that will help you make your job better? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm telling you, when I ask teachers this, a lot of times it's like pencils. It's like, it's so simple. And they appreciate being able to be heard. That is number one. That is one thing that there's a disconnect with our leadership team and our staff. The staff just feel undervalued and under, and they're just not heard. So if we just ask them and with teachers, just know that 
the best thing that you can do for your kids and students and parents, by the way, we improve our parent relationships much better when we just stop talking and Mm. truly just attune to what they're saying. I mean, truly, it is something that we are told to do and we just need to do it. No matter what the answer is, if you give space just to let somebody get their thought out Mm -hmm. and just validate that, it is so powerful. It is. Yeah. And the very last thing I will say for our own selves, like to, so that we're not so overwhelmed is know what your limits are. Respect your own limits. Don't expect people to respect them for you because they probably won't right. or they can't or they don't know how to. That's within your own power to do that. And for crying out loud, ask for what you need. Mm-hmm. Always start with, I need whatever. I need space. I need a second. I need to talk with you about this at another time because right now it doesn't work for me. It is powerful. You can't argue with a need, but then we get to advocate for ourselves and we get to teach other people how to, to then do it. And that's such a beautiful way, uh, I think, to come to the end of this conversation, because I think that there, there's undoubtedly so many people listening right now that probably were like, wow, I actually kind of could use that statement today in something that I'm, I actually thought to myself, oh, that's actually what I should say to this person <laughs> that I'm having an argument with. <laughs> Cause we forget sometimes those simple things like, oh yeah, I can just, I don't have to argue. I can just say I need blank. Um, and that's it. And then step away from it. And, and sometimes you just need to be reminded of that. But I bet that that's going through people's minds as well. So you just solved like 25 problems just with, <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> without even knowing who these people are <laughs> or what these problems are. I hear um, about, I hear from them all the time. <laughs> so I get it. I get it. So one thing I like to ask people before we go is if they, and you can say, you can totally say no, but if you do have anything that you are reading or listening to, or even watching that you want to recommend to people to, even if it's not professional, not something in the professional realm, something that gives us a full picture of who you are as a person, anything, anything you want to tell us that you are consuming in your own brain right now? Gosh, I always have things on the go. (laughs) I always do. I will say there was a great book that I did. I did a book study last year with my kids' school as parents and educators. I was the parent. Mm -hmm. And it's, let me get it. It's right here. I'm going to get it. So I know the the title for you all. Okay. So one of the books that I did in the book study last year with parents and educators, it's called Anxious Kids, Anxious Parents. And it's a great book that everybody can take something away from. So the author is Reed Wilson. Dr. Mm-hmm. Reed Wilson and uh, Lynn Lyons. So that's what I read. And I always recommend that because anxiety is a huge problem mm-hmm. or a concern. I should say a concern for people. Mm-hmm. It's a great book for them. Great. Cool. I've never heard of that. And we will put the links to that in the uh, in our show notes so that people can can check it out. And where can people find you? Thrivingeducator.org is the easiest. Okay. And then I'm on Twitter or X at, um, X. at Charlie. Wow. I think you're the I first know. person to say that on here. I'm like, oh no. I keep hearing it. I'm like, I guess Let's, we got to start it. Uh, right? I guess we got to start it. Oh my goodness. But on Twitter or X, uh, at Charlie Peck, C H A R L E P E C K. And all of that will be in the show notes as well. Well, thank you so much for, uh, finally being able to come together. But yeah, this is great. Thank you so much, Charlie. Yeah. At my absolute pleasure. Thank you. Charlie is just a master at knowing what we need to provide students with in order for them to deal with feeling overwhelmed, but also giving them the opportunity to reset. That's a dichotomy that we often overlook in the day to day, but we need to work more closely with students so they have a better concept of when to work with the overwhelm and when it's time to give ourselves a bit of a recharge opportunity. How do you approach this kind of regular mental health skill with your students? You can let us know what you think by leaving a comment on Substack if you're a subscriber, a review in Apple Podcasts, and you can reach me on Twitter at scandela9. The hashtag optimalist can be used when posting answers to questions we ask here, and I'll be sure to see it. I can also be reached at Sarah at getengageable.com. You can listen and subscribe to the optimalist podcast wherever you love listening to great podcasts. New episodes are released every Wednesday and links to all of our resources are available in the show notes. The optimalist podcast is brought to you by swivel. 
At Swivel, we understand that the biggest challenge in education is the rate of change. Policy revisions, technological advancements, now accelerated by AI, of course, evolving job markets and ongoing research constantly identifying new best practices are only some of the factors affecting the rate of change in education. To learn how Swivel can help you be more reflective, engaged, and adaptable, visit swivel.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for listening to The Optimalist. I'll be back next week with a new conversation. Stay engaged.